Okay. Oh, okay, great. Mm. Okay. Okay, well, I'm Sterl. Uh, the R and the L, there will be a quiz for the East Asians afterwards, but otherwise it's easier to pronounce. Uh, so, um, I'm normally at Caltech, but this year I'm being Dutch on sabbatical and having a great time. Um, so, I guess my excuse for being here, presumably the reason I got invited, is a long, long time ago I predicted this T to the minus five thirds in a long, beautiful paper on the starburst history of the Milky Way, the problems of star formation at high densities, lost cone, tidal disruption rates, tidal stripping of giants, and all anybody remembers is the five-thirds. So <laughs> it's a warning for the young people in the audience when you write long, beautiful papers. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so I want to, uh, we've heard this morning about sort of the baseline tidal disruption event rates of stellar dynamics of spherical star systems with a black hole in the middle. Uh, and the rate depends on essentially diffusion uh, into the loss cone on scales. Typically, the dominant scale is sort of typically around a half a parsec for Milky Way like galaxies. And that's sort of well inside the radius of influence for the Milky Way is a few parsecs. Uh, so it's the rates are then sensitive to the slope of the cusp. And I'll come back to that. I think a lot of people use rather generous cusps and even ridiculously generous cusps. Um, and then I'll say a bit about enhanced tidal disruption rates. Uh, one case is, um, that I'll spend a little time on is the case of having two black holes in the center, and then we'll talk about what happens if we put uh, gas in the middle. Um, <coughs> so here's the gas in the middle. Um, <coughs> so on this case you have more gas, and in this case you have more black hole. <coughs> Uh, so this is lots of black hole and not very much gas, and this is lots of gas and relative to the mass of the black hole. And you get enormous amounts of star formation in this corner and enormous amounts of inflow, and up here you get little inflow and little star formation. Okay, um, <coughs> so let me talk uh, quickly about the black hole binaries. Uh, so uh, this has been done many times. I guess I think the first calculations was by Chen and Madao, who created a very steep star cluster, plonked two black holes down in the middle of it. There was an enormous shredding. If you create a black hole in the middle of an equilibrium star cluster and you create two, it's even more exciting. Um, <coughs> uh, the calculations that uh, my students, uh, Chris Vague and Nate Bode did, we surrounded a primary by an equilibrium stellar cusp, not a non-equilibrium stellar cusp. Uh, <coughs> with the Danan model, we chose Bacall, Wolf, and 1.5, and you'll see later why those two numbers are special for uh, star clusters, if you don't already know. Um, <coughs> that's in contrast to the Chen, who chose uh, 1.5 and 1.75, so very steep R to the minus 2.25 uh, clusters. Uh, and then we allowed a second black hole to spiral in by dynamical friction, starting at large radii, and self-consistently spiral in at the rate set by the ejection of the stars in the usual stellar dynamical way. <coughs> uh, the bound um, cusp, you'll notice that the mass of the cusp scales as the mass of the black hole to the one-half power for the usual m goes as sigma to the fourth relations. So we actually used a fit from Merritt that has a 0.55 instead of a 0.5. But 
doesn't matter very much. <coughs> and then the tidal disruption rate for main sequence stars that depends on a tidal disruption radius compared to this cusp radius that scales again changing rather weakly with the black hole mass and rather more sensitively with the stellar mass. Um, <coughs> so we put the stars and the black holes in the potential of the cusp included the general relativistic precessions and gravitational radiation losses because we were interested in emeries as well. Uh, we used a symplectic integrator with a fictitious time variable, so it's extremely accurate even for point, point 0.59 eccentricity orbit. Uh, <coughs> and then in contrast to some earlier claims, so this shows radius versus an angular momentum relative to the circular angular momentum. This is the famous Kozai wedge. There were some early claims that the dominant effect feeding things in was Kozai perturbations. Clearly, most of the things that are tidally captured were not sent in by COSI. They're just set in by complicated three-body orbits, Newtonian three-body orbits, uh, the two black holes and the single stars as test particles. Um, so here are the rates. The general result is that roughly uh, 10 to the minus 3 of all the stars in the cusp, so that's roughly 10 to the minus 3 of the sum of the two black hole masses with the def this definition of the cusp is the mass at the influence radius. Uh, so about 10 to the minus 3 of them are tidally captured. It's quite a weak dependence on M1 and on mass ratio. The time scale depends on the mass ratio, but the number that get captured doesn't depend <coughs> on much, the mass ratio much. And the time over which you get this, obviously this is an enormously enhanced rate. That's a capture of 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4 stars. In the time scale, which is roughly the time for the black hole to spiral in from the influence radius to the stall radius where it's ejected enough stars that uh, no longer stellar dynamics are no longer shrinking the orbit. Um, <coughs> so here are two representative simulations, one for 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole and the other for 10 to the 8, sort of the two ends of the tidal disruption range that are of interest. Uh, here is the time scale for the enhancement rate for mass ratio of 0.3, so that's 3 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6 solar mass black holes. And here, 0.1, so 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6, so it's a little bit longer because the spiral in is slower for this higher mass ratio. And the peak tidal disruption rates, in this case, are about one every 300 years, and in this case, one every 20 years. So remember, that's in contrast. Chen et al. were getting several per year by these incredibly steep costs with the black holes created in the middle of a non-equilibrium star cluster. So if you can do that somehow, you could get higher rates, but I think these are probably more realistic cusps and realistic in spirals. <coughs> so this again just shows uh, graphically the rate for 10 to the 8, 3, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 7 to show how the rate drops. And the rate is dropping basically because it's the mass of stars that are being captured is scaling with the mass of the black hole. So that's why the dr rate drops. And also the time scale changes a little bit <coughs> as well. And so you can see that typically we're getting rates of order one every 10 years to one every 100 years over a time scale of a few million years for the bacall wolf type cusps. Okay, so let's uh, try to put this in cosmological uh, <coughs> context. So that was all stellar dynamics. We were ignoring all the gas. Is that the right thing to do? So here's the uh, uh, latest Eris BH simulation of the Milky Way from redshift 4 to 0 in this shows, this graph shows the black hole and the masses. There are four black holes that merge during this time. So the total is this top yellow curve and the little steps are where the two black holes actually merge. And you see that at least this, which is carefully designed to be a reasonable simulation of the Milky Way from larger scale simulations, um, hasn't had any significant mergers since a redshift of 1.2. So over the last five billion years, the Milky Way hasn't gotten any significant new binary black holes, so we would be, if this was the typical tidal disruption rate, then everything I've just told you in the last five minutes was irrelevant for the Milky Way. Um, and you look at the gas accretion rate, and since redshift 1.2, so the whole local universe, the gas accretion rate has been about 10 to the minus 5 solar masses a year from the stellar winds and little bits of stuff coming in, the hot phase Bondi accretion, so 3 10 to the minus 4 of Eddington. Uh, so this ga gas phase capture is just making the very low luminosity ADAF in the center, roughly what we see. Um, on the other hand, this simulation probably doesn't allow a star burst producing 100 O stars 10 million years ago. That wouldn't have been uh, predicted in here. 
Uh, this is the total star formation rate in the galaxy times 10 to the minus 3. So you can see the total star formation rate is a few tenths of the solar mass a year, maybe a little low for the, for the Milky Way. And <coughs> so if this was realistic, then stellar dynamics is the whole story. Um, so <coughs> one other thing, since I just threw this in because a lot of people have been saying, oh, well, we can fix everything by tidally disrupting Jupiter and 0.1 solar mass stars. Let me just remind you about mass segregation, that if this was the story, if there was no continuing formation, uh, these are two Fokker-Planck simulations from <coughs> uh, Brian Murphy and collaborators. Uh, so they created stars with the Krupa IMF. This one is a black hole, sort of like the Milky Way. After at the current time, it's four, 4 million solar masses, and this one's 10 times heavier, 4, 10 to the 7. So if we look at this one first, uh, <coughs> There are lots of 10 solar mass remnants of the, of the black holes which dominate the uh, mass density uh, in the inner parts. Uh, the stars, were the main sequence stars, remaining main sequence stars, which actually dominate the density are the one solar mass stars. So th these are the 0.25, so they're about <coughs> uh, one quarter the mass density and about equal numbers in, in number density. But of course these have a larger tidal disruption rate. So the tidal disruption rate actually is dominated by the 0.95 solar mass stars because the low mass stars have been pushed out. Um, <coughs> for the higher mass black hole in this case, um, it turns out that it's actually the one half solar mass stars which are dominating the rate, sort of being set out at the radius of influence. Um, <coughs> so the half to one solar mass stars are sort of winning over the 0.2 solar mass stars in this equilibrium. So just remember is what, what you create is only relevant as the IMF if you look in much less than a relaxation time. The relaxation time is typically a few billion years, uh, so you probably wouldn't expect things to be dominated by the low mass stars, in my opinion. Okay, um, now this assumes the Krupa IMF. You may know that Nyakshin and Sunyayev in 2005 pointed out that in the center of the Milky Way we have of order 100 O stars. Uh, they're less than 10 million years old, so if each one of those should be accompanied by 100 one solar mass T Tauri stars shining an X-ray for 10 million years, and there aren't any, and so they argue that the IMF much be must flatter than this, which will only, if that were, if the last starburst in the center of our own galaxy was typical of what happens in starbursts and nuclei, uh, star formation at the very high densities here, very high optical depths, it's different than the local ISM, maybe that if that's a general top-heavy IMF, then there'll be even fewer 0.2 solar mass stars than predicted in this, which just has a normal interstellar medium IMF. Okay, uh, let me spend a little time. Uh, I think this E plus A uh, business is <coughs> quite interesting, so let me give a slightly different take on it than was given earlier this morning. So as you heard from my ear, um, originally two out of three of the PTF nuclear optical transients were in E plus A galaxies, and yesterday we heard that six out of six <coughs> of the other ones are in E plus A-ish galaxies, shall we say. <laughs> um, <coughs> so let me tell you a little about the history of E plus A galaxies. So the first ever spectrum of the fuzz around the quasar was taken by Borosin and Oak in 1982. Um, <coughs> and they got a spectra of the fuzz around the quasar 3C48. That's quasar number two in the history of quasars, remember? So this was the first time anybody got spectrum of a fuzz. At that time in 1982, there were great arguments about qua whether quasars were actually in galaxies or whether it was gas disks or what the fuzz was. Um, they got the spectrum. There's the spectrum. Uh, H gamma, H delta, <coughs> H8, and so on, right? It, and so they pointed out that this was an underlying galaxy is a spiral in which a massive star formation burst was triggered at least 10 to the 8th years ago. It's a classic E plus A spectrum. Okay, <coughs> uh, if you look at the recent history, uh, 2015, here's all the uh, study of the spectra of the fuzz around all the Sloan quasars at redshift less than 1. And they find that almost all of them are basically post-star burst E plus A-ish spectra, stellar ages around 1 giga years. Um, and the, the post-starburst uh, name, I think, is generally agreed to be a bit misleading. It means you need star formation, and then you have to stop it very suddenly. You don't actually need a burst, but you have to stop it very suddenly so that you can eventually get 
the light dominated by the A stars without having B stars contributing extra blue light. So that's the crucial step. So you have to really drop the star formation rate by a factor of 100 fairly quickly over a time scale of less than 100 million years or so to get these type spectra. Okay, so this is the majority. This is 191 quasars, redshift less than one, and the majority of them have these kind of spectra. So you can now ask the, you know, the general class of these galaxies. So they were, this uh, class was first invented by Dressler and Gunn in 1983, the year after Boris and Ernoke found the quasar had these spectra. And they were looking in a cluster around the radio galaxy 3C295, which is how you got high redshift galaxies in those days. Um, and in this cluster around 3C295, it's rather remarkable. 10% of the cluster members are safer galaxies, and 10% of them are E plus A's. If you look in the coma cluster, zero out of 200 galaxies are E plus A's. And if you look in the, their random sample of 1,200 gal cluster galaxies they'd gotten spectra of, only 10 of them had this, of which three were in this cluster. Okay, so these E plus A galaxies and safer galaxies seem not only to be in the same thing, they also are great friends, even when they're not. Uh, so the current status is uh, again, from the Sloan survey, looking specifically for galaxies with this type of spectrum, but now not in Seyfert's or quasars. Uh, the space density is actually comparable to the space density of quasars. Um, <coughs> the specific star formation rate, as I said, you have to drop it really dramatically. So the star formation rate per unit stellar mass is about a tenth to a thirtieth of that in the Milky Way, and that's how you create these type spectra. Um, <coughs> and <coughs> uh, so the other recent term for these kind of galaxies, some of you may have heard about the green valley between the red and the blue type galaxies, the early types. So if you plot uh, color versus stellar mass, uh, you can also plot color-color diagrams. They're basically all the early type galaxies. And this paper, uh, Sherwinsky et al., uh, again, was going through Sloan and then <coughs> using the galaxy zoo, actually classifying these morphologically. So these really are early type in the Hubble definition of the shape, and these really are disk galaxies in the shape, but the colors reflect that. So the early type galaxies, uh, which tend to be red, they're the disk galaxies, which tend to be blue and somewhat lower mass, and then there's this rayer patch in the middle, and this is where the E plus A's live. And these galaxies are so rare in this patch that, in fact, you can't say that all spiral galaxies gradually turn off their star formation <coughs> rate and end up here, or you get way too many in here. So it's only like one one hundredth of them that actually have this sudden stop of this star formation. So the, um, in the last five years, there's been great, many of you heard about AGN feedback and mergers quenching star formation and so on. So the idea is that something, uh, rare events quench, suddenly quench star formation in galaxies which evolve up to these early type galaxies and are responsible for these rare E plus A both both starburst galaxies. Um, <coughs> so here's a little more just showing the uh, star formation rates that you need in order to get up into this that you really have to turn off the star formation rate in less than about 100 million years in order to end up in this region. Otherwise, you sort of march off in this direction or march off uh, <coughs> too, too far to the blue instead of moving up in the, di in the diagram. Um, <coughs> now, the question of how this actually happens, uh, the pop one popular story is that you have AGN feedback. On the other hand, the AGN feedback is a bit problematic because we saw most AGNs actually have E plus A spectra. So while the AGN phase is go just turning on, you might think, how did it eject the stuff a billion years ago, right? Um, <coughs> so I think the more uh, popular story is one, uh, I guess, first proposed by Hopkins, that <coughs> this shows in his simulations the star formation rate, and this shows the black hole accretion rate, and here's a few hundred million years. Um, and the reason for that is that the black hole accretion rate depends on the density of gas in the very innermost parts, and the star formation rate is averaged over the whole galaxy, a few kiloparsecs. And it takes a long time for the stuff to drain from the outer parts into the inner parts. So by the time you've drained the gas and formed it into stars in the outer parts of the galaxy, there's still some dregs left in the middle, and those dregs are what allow the black hole to keep accreting. It may have actually, in some simulations, you can get it to be accreting during the starburst as well, but then it's buried and it's an ultra-luminous IRS galaxy and you don't call it a quasar. 
So by the time you see it as a quasar, all the mess is cleared out from the outer parts, and it's just the dregs coming in that are still powering the, the inner parts of the gas. And this shows the star formation rate and the black hole accretion rate defined in the inner uh, 10 parsecs of the galaxy, or 20 parsecs, I guess, in this region. Okay, so some implications for the <coughs> on TDEs. Um, <coughs> I think the most interesting implication is that the, you know, the looking at the connection between these E plus A-ish galaxies and the uh, AGN is that it indicates that the star formation in the outer parts of the galaxy is turned off, but there still is currently or very recently been lots of gas in the nuclear region to either feed the black hole or cause nuclear star formation. So I think there's interesting possibilities for um, enhanced rates and imposters, as I'll mention briefly. Um, one is that if you have a significant amount of gas, by significant this means like more than 10 or 20 percent of the mass of the black hole in a disk on the scale of subparsec, then <coughs> the disk is self-gravitating on those scales, it clumps up, gets uh, eccentric instabilities and so on. and so you can scatter any stars which you made around there uh, in the disk using the disk as the clumpy medium or the um, <coughs> non-symmetrical non m equals one mode to scatter the stars. And of course the large numbers of young stars that you would have here also might be supernova imposters that I'll discuss briefly in the last minute. Um, <coughs> so if you sort of work out again these uh, enhanced rates, I think it's quite easy to arrange that the typical TDE is not in a typical spiral galaxy. Um, <coughs> and, there, and again, because if you have, if it's associated with this young star, uh, recent star formation, there could be significant numbers of 10 solar mass stars undergoing disruptions, which we might not be keeping at the moment because they'll be slow, right? They're 100 times lower density than one solar mass stars. Um, <coughs> so. Here's the complicated formula to explain why that's true, right? We've heard that spherical stellar dynamics gives a rate of, I put 6, 10 to the minus 5 as the geometric mean between the old 2, 10 to the minus 5 and this morning's 2, 10 to the minus 4. Uh, since a redshift of 1, 5 billion years, you can arrange that by having 0.1 per year for a few million years, either by the binary black holes or scattering young stars and disks. And that means that half of the TDEs are from this class and half are from that class, so this is a significant contribution to the rate. So these would be the E plus A, potential, potentially. Um, <coughs> let me skip over the uh, star formation in the galaxies and just uh, leave you with the imposters. So as we heard, the TDE, optical TDEs we see are 10 to the 51 ergs, about a solar mass, several thousand kilometers a second. You tell that to an astronomer and there's a knee-jerk reaction, supernova. <coughs> now, of course, the supernova don't have, opti the typical ones don't optically tend to the 51 ergs because of adiabatic expansion, so you have to reconvert the kinetic energy to thermal energy on the right time scale to get months or year time scales. Uh, but in the centers of galaxies, uh, I think that's actually not hard to arrange. So the recently discovered magnetar in the center of the Milky Way has a ratio of rotation measure to dispersion measure of 2.5 milligauss, dominated by the 0.1 to 5 parsec. That's a magnetic pressure more than a million times larger than that in the interstellar medium, local interstellar medium. So, <coughs> uh, so that means that neutral and photoionized gas density in equilibrium of this will have densities of 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 9 per cubic centimeter. And <coughs> If you blow up a supernova in this sort of material, it goes directly from the uh, free expansion phase, skips the set-off phase, goes immediately into the radiative phase in less than a year. So t to the minus 5 thirds, I think, remains an interesting puzzle, but <coughs> uh, I think it's worth thinking a little bit about whether some of these old Turlovich ideas of trying to make AGNs by supernovae in dense media might actually be happening, maybe not all the quasars, but some of the interesting events we see might actually be these. I'll stop there.
No, no, the, the, so that's the accretion rate, not the luminosity, remember. So at those uh, accretion rates below about uh, a hundredth of a Eddington or maybe a few thousandths of Eddington, right, the, the efficiency becomes very low. So the luminosity, the, the, the gas accretion rate in the center of the Milky Way is thought to be about 10 to the minus 5. The luminosity is you know, 10 to the 36, 10 to the 37 ergs a second. There's also the question of how much starts mm -hmm. on the way in and then gets plugged out. Yeah, th this this was purported. This was purportedly a Bundy rate come yeah. coming in, but uh, I think it, that rate, depending on your details of your views about ADAFs, I think that could be consistent with the luminosity. Yeah, so I would support uh, Julian's point because the ten to minus seven you mentioned actually comes from the rotation measurements, yeah. and this tells us about the uh, the density in the interior of the not about the luminosity. So I thought about the accretion rate, not the at the level of ten to minus seven, which may be much lower than the Bundy accretion rate. But sorry, the rotation measure doesn't tell you the gas oh, density. You oh, mean. talking about that yeah. uh, sort of or the high frequency radio looking at that yeah, 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 and that yeah. indicates a much lower density close in. Yeah, no, no, no yeah. So, sorry, I, I was talking about the accre the accretion rate of point one parsec or something. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, yeah. So the point you mentioned about whether we really need a starburst or just quenching the uh, point, I mean, we've actually started testing that. So we're running several populations in six months on the host. So and at this point, they do seem to be more consistent with a starburst than just a regular starburst. So, so they seem, I mean, are they then different in s a subtle way from the generic green valleys, which I think they should should be, be, uh, yeah. But yeah, we're we're running, we're really trying to figure out where they are in space. Because right. I guess that really depends on the. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so that, I guess this, that depends on making sure you understand the giants, because I guess the, the Libra arm between the A stars and the older ones that will set the starburst will be sort of in the red or infrared. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there estimates of the black hole masses in the Oh, the yeah, yeah, so, so the, the quasar ones, of course, are, you know, depending on the luminosity of the quasar, they're the usual. 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 for the Seiferts and 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 for the quasars from the M sigma and other and H, H alpha line width estimates and so on. In the ordinary E plus, in the E plus A's that are not AGN, there are <coughs> some, about half of them are AGN and the other half are not. Um, some of them sort of show liner spectra and the usual arm waving suggests there are a few 10 to the 7, 10 to the 7, but not sure, the liners, black hole masses from line widths are a bit dodgy, so I don't know how much right, to trust them. Sigma, the oh, in the stellar segment, yeah, they're, they're again, it, they're, there's a range, but it, it, they would, the predictions you would get from this, gal the stellar masses are a few 10 to the 7 on up to, ten to the several 10 to the 8. Um, no, the, the interest, well, the, you might get gamma rays. The, the one interesting thing about these is that in the high density regions, you, because you go directly into the radiative phase from free expansion, you have shocks that are five or 10,000 kilometers a second. So you actually expect hard X-ray transients, which would be an interesting signal to look for, I think. Yeah, on, on that note, on the imposter, do you expect that some more extreme UV, which is Well, I, th I think these probably, I wouldn't expect a lot of UV. As I said, you know, the, the most of the cooling luminosity comes out actually in the, in the X-rays, sort of KEV X-rays. Um, and there will be some UV as it cools down or if the X-rays get reprocessed, but it's not sort of a fundamental, <coughs> fundamental part of it. You can u then use the X-rays photoionize and produce optical emission in the bubble around it. But there's intrinsically, it's not UV.
about OS Wazowski on a GRMHC simulation of a Ray Post title discussion. Yes, thank you. This will be a different talk, not about rates, but about one special uh, event which I will try to simulate. And there will be no introduction, uh, <laughs> but there will be, will be a, bit of a, a bit of an introduction to the method which I actually use. And let me immediately jump into it. And the method combines the SPH approach with grid-based general relativistic MHD code. I am not an expert on SPH. I guess most of you know bet much more about the SPH approach than I do, so there is only one slide about the SPH approach. The bottom line is this is uh, this, uh, the code developed, a kind of a standard code, code developed initially by Stefan Rosvog, which includes, however, uh, uh, exact accelerations acting on test particles in care, <coughs> in, in care space times. So it is supposed to uh, co cover, it is supposed to follow the uh, geodesics properly uh, in the relativistic regime as well. And the idea of this project is to combine the uh, SPH uh, output with a follow-up simulation uh, within the scheme of a general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. And this is the part which I am in charge in. Uh, th I will, uh, for this project, I use the code which I developed uh, a couple of years ago. It is called, called Coral, and it com combines the following elements. It combines the evolution of gas within magno ideal magno magnetohydrodynamics. It also is capable of solving radiative transfer under M1 approximation. It solves the equations in general relativity in a fixed space-time and on a fixed grid. And this allows us to set the grid, the inner edge of the grid, even inside the black hole horizon and, cover and, um, and uh, um, trace the accretion rate through the horizon uh, precisely. And the simulation can be done in a, in a global context so that the whole accretion disk can be uh, simulated. And originally I come uh, from the field of uh, simulating accretion flows and uh, recently I have been simulating super Eddington accretion flows. And this is an example of a simulation like that. Um, which uh, accretes uh, at the rate of 10 times Eddington accretion rate. The left-hand side shows the evolution of the gas density, and the right-hand side the evolution of the radiation energy density or radiation pressure, if you prefer. So it was kind of natural to migrate into the field of uh, tidal disruption events because we know that we expect, at least initially, um, super Eddington accretion rates on the black holes. So let's think what can we do with a code like this in the context of a tidal disruption event. There are limits to what we can do. And the limits come from the fact that this is a grid-based code. And the grid-based codes have a limit on the time step that can be applied, which is related to the usually light crossing time through the smallest cell. So if we have a relatively small time step and we still need to do a three-dimensional simulation, it means that we can't simulate this, um, this event forever. So there is a limited duration of the simulation. There is the limit on the duration of simulation. Other limit is re um, related to the resolution. The resolution is finite. We can't help that. And this, one has to take care that um, one has to be sure that the um, event that one wants to simulate will never become thinner than one or a couple of uh, grid cells. And this leads us to uh, like a, a setup which is favorable in this case. Uh, so if we simulate an elliptical orbit and a large impact parameter, we can hope for the event to be kind of limited or to be taking place in a limited region which can be covered by a grid-based code. And also large impact parameter uh, usually gives us a relatively thick nozzle so that it does not become excessively thin. And this is the SPH simulation that we initially simulated. We took the following parameters for the system. We chose the mass ratio 10 to 6 with the stellar um, mass 0.1 uh, solar masses. And we chose the eccentricity of 0.97, very large impact parameter of the order of uh, 10, which corresponded to the pericenter radius, roughly at 7 gravitational radii. And this is the evolution of the SPH particles in the simulation. You see that uh, there is a very significant uh, relativistic precession at the first encounter, and then the uh, the star is disrupted, it does not go to infinity, it's a bound star, all the debris is bound, so ev eventually all the gas will come back to, uh, towards the black hole. And what we do, we take the snapshot of the SPH simulation just before the first particles come back to the black hole, and we translate it on the grid-based uh, code, we translate it into coral. And here you see actually the density at the equatorial plane or at the initial stage of the, SP of the coral 
simulation with the velo velocity streamlines showing um, uh, how, how does where does uh, gas uh, go at the beginning of the simulation. And uh, we wanted to perform three simulations, and ultimately we performed two. So I will discuss initially in m most details the hydro purely hydrodynamical simulation. Then there will be a couple of slides about the MHD version of exactly the same simulation. And initially the idea was to perform also a radiative simulation, which can, uh, where one can follow the radiation field when, where the photons are generated and actually they can uh, leave the system and one can calculate in principle the light curves. However, this very setup which we chose for the simulation turned out to produce such optically thick event that the whole domain was uh, filled with optically thick gas, so there was no photosphere and actually there was no point in actually following the radiation in the simulation. The parameters of the two simulations that I will describe are given here. The inner edge was inside, is inside the horizon, the outer edge was at 1000 gravitational radii, which was enough to cover the whole evolution of the gas. The resolution was moderate and it was uh, performed uh, for, relati uh, for um, a long time of uh, 100,000 uh, gravitational times, which corresponded for this setup to only 13 hours and uh, corresponded to 1000 orbits at ISCO. So please, um, uh, 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 so it was uh, uh, long in terms of gravitational time, but also in terms of physical time. And let us now go into the hydrodynamical simulation that, and I will discuss two phases of the, that simulation. I will, and I will start with the self-crossing, which, which is um, expected and is expected because the, um, because the uh, impact parameter, parameter was large. So we expect a lot of um, uh, relativistic precession. I will show this type of an animation a couple of times. This is the horizontal slice through the simulation, so through the equatorial plane. And we see the initial uh, input coming from the SPH simulation and the black hole is at the center and the gas will start falling from the top right down to the black hole. The bottom panel will show the vertical slice uh, across this dashed line. And here's the uh, history of the accretion rate and this dashed line, this horizontal line corresponds to 10,000 Eddington accretion rates. And this is the accretion rate through the black hole horizon. So let us see what happens. So we see that the gas comes back, comes to the black hole, there is significant bending so that the gas comes back and hits the incoming stream. And we see a couple of things. So we see, uh, as expected, the, the nozzle, and I will pay a, a bit of attention to the nozzle. We see the relativistic precession, and we see that this, um, uh, that this self crossing takes place in a relatively extended region, let's say between 10 and 50 gravi gravitational radii. And I will zoom in in a moment. And there are two things that I want to pay your, uh, put your attention to. One is that there is a significant quasi-spherical outflow coming out of the system and there is also some kind of periodic pattern. But let's start with the nozzle. So this is a spherical slice through the radius 12 which corresponds to, this, uh, to the region, to the exactly where the nozzle lo is located. And you see that actually the thickness of the nozzle is not small, it's relatively extended, which is a good thing for a grid-based code like this. And this comes from the fact that this is a very close encounter and also it's an elliptical encounter, which means that the, 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 the distribution of the velocity vectors inside this debris is pretty wide and actually we do not get very thin uh, nozzle at all. This is this, uh, the inner region of the self-crossing at one uh, moment of time where the self-crossing is kind of most evident. This is the plot showing the density and we see that the gas comes back and hits the, in, uh, the, the incoming stream between let's say radius 10 and 50. This is the temperature and this is the entropy. So it is clear that there is, the, there is at least one major shock where this interaction takes place, where the temperature is also the highest. And there is a trace of another shock uh, in that region, but there is nothing in the nozzle, maybe because this nozzle is so thick. What does happen when we have, um, uh, when we have such a shock? What happens is that the gas coming back carries significant kinetic energy. It hits the incoming stream, it shocks, and this kinetic energy is dissipated. And what happens is that the debris coming down to towards the black hole is heated up and the gas which loses its kinetic energy becomes more bound and actually it later on falls down on the black hole. And this is uh, once again another uh, view of the self-crossing in the innermost region. This will be an animation showing at the, the evolution of density at the equatorial plane and vertical slices along the dashed line. This will show the density, this will show the Bernoulli number. So red color with will correspond to unbound gas blue color will correspond to the bound gas. And this is what happens. You see 
that uh, the, the gas comes back, hits the stream, it hits, the st it, it hits up the stream, the stream becomes quite hot and then it is likely to drive some outflow and this we see that there is quasi-spherical outflow coming back from this region which is heat and he and uh, heated up by the returning stream. And we, if I relate again, we also can notice that there is some kind of periodic behavior. So we see like waves of gas leaving on the system. Let's see what, let's pay more attention, look closely, let's look closely at the outflow and the gas flowing out from the system. So let's define a sphere of a radius 100 and let's integrate the accretion rate, let's integrate the amount of gas crossing the surface and plot it as a function of time. This is this um, purple line on this plot. And then we can do the exactly the same exercise at the outer edge of the whole of the box, and this would be the orange line. So we see that plenty of gas is crossing the surface. It's reasonable because this gas does not, is not limited to rate, the gas which comes back to the black hole is deflected, it's not limited to the radius of 100. It, it by itself wants to go also to larger radii, but significant fraction of it is actually the gas which is uh, flowing out through this quasi-spherical quasi -spherical outflow. And we see some periodicity, in this, uh, in this uh, curve of the accretion rate. And one can also notice that the amount of the gas which crosses the ultimately the boundary of the box is lower. It's roughly, let's say, third part of the gas or fourth part of the gas that crosses radius 100, which means that from the gas which flows out through this radius, through, through this sphere plotted here, only fourth part actually leaves the system. The, the, la the remaining part will ultimately come down on the black hole because it was not unbound enough to, uh, it was not unbound to leave the system. Okay, so when, where does this peri periodicity uh, come from? Uh, it comes from the following fact. We can easily imagine the following like feedback loop. We have an accretion flow which is deflected, debris which is stream which is deflected. It hits the debris from um, more or less the same side from, from the other side, but it contributes more to the angular momentum of that. It increases a bit the angular momentum of the incoming debris which means that if you increase the angular momentum of the debris, it means that the pericenter radius moves slightly out. If it moves slightly out, it, it, it means that the deflection angle, the relativistic precession angle will be lower, and you will start hitting the debris at larger radii, where you will less efficiently affect that debris, which means that the, uh, its angular momentum will come back to the original value, and the same thing happens with the pericenter radius. And then you again start hitting the stream with a large efficiency, and there is this kind of feedback loop which drives the, the type of uh, oscillations printed on top of the, uh, uh, the amount of gas flowing out of the system. In this very simulation, the period is 800 dynamical times, which corresponds, uh, gravitational times, which corresponds to the uh, Keplerian peri period of at radius 25, which is more or less where the self-interaction, self-crossing -cross takes place. So if, you, if one um, uh, writes down the formula for the Keplerian uh, velocity of Keplerian angular velocity as a function of radius as a, and as a function of black hole mass, one gets the following number. So for like uh, typical parameters of a tidal disruption, one should expect <coughs> the period of that uh, roughly at 10 to minus 3 hertz, is hertz, so like one hour. Okay, and such a periodicity should, will be visible or efficient only in case of a close encounter where this kinetic velocity of the processed flow is significant when, comp uh, when uh, compared to the uh, energy in the incoming stream, but it also requires zero black hole spin, uh, or at least uh, if the black hole spin is not um, zero, that the, uh, uh, the plane of the incoming star is uh, actually coincides with the plane of the black hole spin. So there are some condition conditions that have to be satisfied, but uh, it is possible and this is what we see in the simulation itself. So the summary of the phase one is that we see outflows, that we see some periodicity and actually the accretion rate which falls on the black hole and this is marked with this red dashed line is uh, significant in terms of the Lington accretion rate but it's not so significant in terms of the total amount of mass available and it comes from the direct accretion uh, coming out, com uh, resulting from the um, resulting from the self-interaction uh, self -interaction of the debris. Okay, now the second phase. The second phase is the uh, phase where the disk is formed. And this is the, uh, now we continue the very same animation and we see that the star comes down and after a couple of hours, it is uh, actually all the debris of the star is within this box where I plot this animation. And you see that actually the disk uh, circularizes pretty quickly and forms a beautiful disk, disk-like structure, which is very optically thick and which is turbulent. 
So what happens? Um, the circularization takes place once all the debris is down um, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the region. And why is this circularization possible at all? We originally have angular momentum and specific energy corresponding to an elliptical orbit, but we end up with a circular orbit at much lower, smaller radius. How is this possible? To, get to obtain a, sp sp to obtain a, sp a circular orbit at a lo lo lower radius, we need to get rid of the uh, we need to get rid of the orbital energy, and this actually happens. The orbital energy is uh, of the gas is uh, going down and approaches more or less the Keplerian vi value. And uh, this energy goes both into, the, into driving the outflow, which we have just discussed, but also it goes in a significant fraction of it goes into the thermal energy of this flow. And the flow becomes so hot that, uh, uh, as you will see in a moment, the gradient of pressure can actually support this structure. And then we have the average structure of the circularis disk, a beautiful Polish, very thick Polish donut. Let's look at the properties uh, of that system. The angular momentum is very low and is more or less the co corresponds more or less to the angular momentum of the initial star. And it's much lower than in case of a regular super Eddington accretion disk I like to simulate. The specific energy of the disk, it is also more or less, the total spe specific energy is, is more or less equal to the stellar specific energy. But if we print, if we plot only the orbital energy of that gas, it is more or less Keplerian and the excess goes into the uh, thermal energy. So what is this like? What is this disk structure like? It's weakly bound gas, it's low angular momentum, it's more or less like zebra, like predicted. Uh, however, it's not exactly zebra because it has like constant angular momentum, which was not exactly um, uh, taken into account in that model. But it is more or less exactly thick zebra as uh, expected. Now the history of the accretion rate, on the black hole, this looks like that. The initial phase comes from uh, the direct outflow. And where does the late stage come from? The late stage comes, where do we get the accretion in the after the circularization takes place? This is a plot which shows the local accretion rate on the poloidal plane. And somewhat surprisingly, the accretion does not take place in the bulk of the disk, as usually in accretion disk. What happens is that the most of the accretion comes actually along the edge of the torus. The gas actually falls down on the black hole along the polar axis. Where does it come from? It comes from the fallback. So you, re you remember at, initi at the initi initial self-crossing stage, we had a plenty of outflow coming from the system. At the late stage, we have plenty of inflow coming uh, roughly along the vertical direction. And the, the turbulence that we see inside the disk, the hydrodynamical turbulence, is not efficient. It is not producing significant accretion in s the, uh, near the equatorial plane. So the summary of the phase two, we have circularization, we have zebras, and but the accretion comes through the fallback, only through the fallback. Now we go to the MHD simulation, exactly the same initial setup, but I put some um, very relatively weak field magnetic field in the initial star, and this magnetic field is brought in with the, uh, with the gas uh, towards the black hole, and then, yes? It's in the star in the SPH? Uh, no, no, just after translating onto coral, I put some ma in arbitrary magnetic field at the initial stage of the grid-based simulation. It was not in the SPH. And this magnetic field is initially insignificant, but we have differential rotation, and differential rotation means that the, uh, the, the, that means that the magnetic field lines are stretched and they grow in power. And this plot shows that the colors, which are on top of the original density contour, density plot, shows the ratio of the magnetic energy density to the rest mass energy density, and you see that with time it goes up, increases in power, and also extends to the larger radii. If it was like a regular standard disk, we would expect that this grows up, grows up. At some point, the g resolution is enough to resolve the magnetorotational instability, and we end up with a typical uh, like accreting system. However, this is not the case here. This shows the ratio of the magnetic to the gas pressure as a function of time, with different shown with different colors, and as a function of the um, radius. And we see that the power of the magnetic field grows up, grows with time, extends to larger radii, but it saturates. And it does not saturate at the level of where we would expect it. For a regular disk, it would be 10 to minus 1 of the total pressure. Um, even if our resolution was very pure, poor and we could not resolve magnetorotational instability, we should expect that the magnetic power would grow more or less to the equilibrium stage, to the equipartition state. This, not not this does not happen here. Magnetic field saturates at very weak level, very low level. How is this possible? 
this is, these are the particle orbits in a standard accretion disk. 10 times accretion rate, 10 times Eddington accretion rate. I put crosses in four points uh, along the radius 100 and I trace the particles for more or less one orbital period at that radius and this is what we get. Beautiful uh, circular accretion. But remember, the, the disk which I all get uh, here has a very low angular momentum, actually almost flat angular momentum, which means that the particles go much slower along, the, uh, along, the azimuthal, along their orbits, along the azimuthal directions. These are, the part these are the trajectories of the particles in the tidal disruption uh, disk. They are completely different, and this comes from two facts. One, is the one fact is that the basically they are very slow on their in their azimuthal, azimuthal motion, the second fact is that they are very energetic. They are almost exactly marginally bound. So they ha there is plenty of power which can kind of steer this gas in the poloidal plane, and it makes the particles go to the left and right. James. Uh, so, like, even in the previous plot, uh, so the magnetization tends to be higher to go closer to the black hole. Yes. Um, I do not have a good answer right now. I, I will have to think about it. Let's talk about it. But if it does grow um, to larger numbers when you get to the closer to the black hole because you have more orbits that you can cover within a phys given physical time. But as you see that actually even in the innermost region you saturate the number. So it seems like you saturate at some level and it, w it should not grow up longer. So the idea is that here you do we do not have a good, well-defined, well-pronounced pro differential rotation. What we have is rather gas, uh, kind, of, kind of turbulent gas with not so significant azimuthal rotation. Okay, so this is the summary of the magnetization thing. It does saturate at ineff inefficiently at the level of, let's say, one, uh, roughly 100 times weaker than standard accretion disk. In this simulation which I performed, this level was not enough to resolve magnetic rotation instability, so I don't see it. But if my resolution was infinite, I would still expect that the MRIs would saturate at a level much lower than in standard accretion disks. So let's say my guess is alpha would be 10 to minus 4. What does it mean? We, set, we move gas close to the black hole. We generate this Polish, to Polish donut torus, with the ordered zebra torus, and we put in viscosity 10 to minus 4. What accretion rate we get? We get 100 times lower accretion rate than we would got for typical viscosity 10 to minus 2. So this may suggest that the accretion rates that we ultimately get from the circularized disk will be very low. The bottom line from the, or the takeaway point from the MHD simulation is viscosity is probably inefficient. The summary slide. So I performed a simulation, Hydra and MHD, of a close encounter with elliptical orbit. Initial state, from, uh, initial state comes from SPH simulation. We resolve horizon, and what we find is definitely not the standard picture. We have outflows, we have periodicity, we have direct accretion initially, but later on we have weakly bound torus of gas, and the accretion only from the feedback, there's no direct accretion in the equatorial plane, and if MHD, uh, and the results from the MHD part suggest that ultimately the viscosity which will be triggered in, in such a system will be uh, inefficient, and will not bring enough magnetic field to generate jets, and will produce very low accretion rate through the black hole. Thank you. I will appreciate questions. I'm going to take the chairman's privilege. Yes. And yes. I want to understand your argument about the um, no MRI, even though you don't actually calculate it. Uh, which is, are, is the claim that the orbital shear is very low? Yes. It, it's difficult to define only shear because there's. She, like typical shear would be in the azimuthal direction, and we have also a lot of shear in the radial direction because of this turbulent motion. So the shear will be different. This is what I would say, and my guess is that it would produce less efficient saturation okay, level of MRI. Can you quantify that? Can no. You quantify the actual shear. You can measure it in your, in your data. Yes, but uh, well, okay, I can quantify azimuthal shear, shear. I can quantify radial shear, but it will not tell me how efficient, how at what level the MRI would saturate. One would have to study this no, like kind of independently. You need, you need to actually calculate. It normalize that shear in units of the orbital frequency and you know, characteristically the growth rate is proportional to that shear. Yes, but th this is not clear to me that if the radial shear will be comparable in power to the, sh uh, to the azimuthal shear, then we can kind of directly extrapolate or take standard MRI picture to this regime. Yeah, that may or may not matter. 
Um, I think it, it matters because we have this significant radiant motion, which s significantly affects the satura saturation level of the non-MRI magnetic field. So it's, it seems natural to, to expect that it will also affect the saturation le level of the instability. <laughs> Excuse me? Natural is subjective. Uh, okay, yes, absolutely it is. Okay, so fir first thing is that it is launched from that region of the self-intersection, but mostly from the, uh, from the uh, layer where the two streams interact with each other. There is a continuous spectrum of the energy of the ejected outflow, so it's like some of it goes to 100, but some of it goes to 500, some of it goes to 50 ra radii. And maybe one point that one should make is that this was a bound orbit of the star, right, Wh which is relatively s bound and the debris is the, uh, bound at the level of 2 times 10 to minus 3. If we had a parabolic orbit, it would be probably 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5. Then one should expect even more outflow if the uh, uh, pericenter is, is so close and if the, uh, the shock uh, effect is so important. Uh, so this calculation does not include any effects of radiation pressure? Is that correct? Um, so it did not. However, uh, if you... You, you kind of mimic the radiation pressure by the total pressure of the gas. So if I performed exactly the same simulation with radiation, and it, was, it is totally optically thick, so it would look exactly the same, but uh, my temperature of the gas would go down from 10 to 11 to 10 to probably 7, and the rest of the pressure would be provided by radiation. Well, the way for it, what was your idea about index? If four over three. Yeah. So it's like optically thick, but the adiabatic index would probably not be it's too important. Okay, this is the, the plot. The red is 10 to 11. Okay, so th this is kind of orange, so 10 to 10 to 11. Uh, but once again, this is um, purely hydro, and that's the point which uh, Nathaniel made. If radiation pressure was included, probably the gas temperature would go down. Yes. which is like natural time scale, right, for a supermassive black hole. But that may be one possibility. So how this periodicity is imprinted on the light curve is kind of an open question. In this very simulation, it is kinetic energy of the outflow. But if, if it was less optically thick, so then I would suspect that, well, definitely we have this periodicity with the, in the amount of power which is generated at the, at the shock, and if this sh the cooling time there is short and optical depth is low, this would immediately be imprinted on the radiation. But, I yeah. but if it is X-rays, then it is in, in the jet. Uh, so that makes it more complicated. I don't know how to explain that. And then you probably have an orbital plane tilted to the spin axis. Yes, yeah, so this is what I pointed out. Zero spin, you get it. With, with non-zero spin, it's more difficult. Well, well, but they are less bound than the original gas which f f falls in. Also, they can take some part of the energy. Sure, but, but I think it's a small, very, very, very small part of the energy. But in your simulation, it goes out the outer boundary and never returns. Uh, so third part of the outflow goes through the outer boundary, yes, yeah. and never so returns. So in effect, that does take energy from the uh, it the, Okay, so it takes energy from the computational box, absolutely. but. If speaking in terms of the energy taken away from the innermost region, then, well, they do, simply. They yeah, do take the energy. Back. Exactly. Unless it cools on the outside. 
Well, energy is total energy is conserved. I'm just unless, saying. That's what I say. And unless it can, in, because suppose you have a box that went out to infinity. Yes. Then, if the streams are found and they don't radiate, then they you know, energy is conserved and it comes back. It may change form, but it comes back. Yes, but what's so the way you can conclude is if they radiate from the at a large distance, the optical depth is smaller. I'm lost the point. So, uh, what's the point? <laughs> oh, you know, but the energy doesn't actually leave the system. Um, Yes, okay, yes, absolutely. The point is that the gas of the star is bound. And by itself, it would not go out further out than, let's say, to 500 gravitational radii. This is the, uh, the orbital energy of the, the star. But it goes further out, so it, has to, it had to get energy from somewhere. And sure, but, but the difference between 1 over 500 RG and 1 over 5,000 RG is tiny relative to... Really you're one you're one making one a good point. Energy, which is what you need to circularize the energy, right? So, so you know, that, that change is... You're making a good point. So pr I, what I will do, I will uh, quantify the amount of energy taken by the outflow and compare it to the energy deposit in the thermal energy, and probably I will find that it is not so significant. Good point. Yeah, I just <coughs> wonder how uh, this uh, kind of thing, this option would look like uh, because of these uh, enormous temperature, and I guess the density is also very high. The dens densities of the gas, yeah. uh, these units are screwed up. Uh, 10 to minus 4 grams per centimeter cubed. Mm -hmm. Well, but I think this particular setup would be optically thick, so they would be coupled efficiently. Uh, it's not yet that level, I think. It's 10 to 4 Eddington accretion rates. It's not yet the, in the regime of gamma ray bursts. The, the, yes. It, it approaches this regime, I do agree. And m maybe one remark I should have made in the beginning. This particular setup which I simulated is super unlikely. I chose it because it's, uh, it's uh, convenient from the computational point of view. But I think that uh, after every step one can make this uh, mental experiment and think what it would look like for a parabolic, uh, for a parabolic encounter. In, in most cases, one can say that it would hold for parabolic encounter as well, as long as the uh, impact parameter is very large. So are you resolving, uh, you think, the spiral shock that you see in the simulation? Uh, you can get a lot of magnetic field Which is the spiral shock? So that red uh, spiral shaped thing in your Here? Um, I would have to do the numbers. Uh, the resolution in the radio, the, the, the grid size in radius is logarithmic. So actually, like half of, of, my, of all my cells are actually in this region. So I would not be worried about the innermost region. There's, the resolution is pretty high over there. But let's do the numbers together. We have something to talk about later. Thank you. Testing. Hello everyone, my name is Alexei Ginorozov. I'm a graduate student at Columbia, um, and I'll take the liberty of changing my time tell you where they are, but I'm going to try to address the question of, is it possible that they are hiding, without necessarily telling you their hiding place. But before I jump into my talk, I want to uh, give credit to uh, the rest of my group, so in particular, I'd like to highlight uh, Petr Mimika. Later on in this talk, I'll be showing simulations of radio light curves from jets, and that's all uh, Petr's uh, work. Okay. So first, I'll start by giving some observational background on jetted tidal disruption events. So one such example is SWIFT 1644. 
In this event, we see hard non-thermal x-rays with rapid time variability at early times. And then later on, we see radio emission. And this is somewhat analogous to a GRV. You have some prompt emission and then uh, radio afterglow from interaction of the outflow with the surrounding medium. So let's focus on the radio observation. So this is the radio light curve for Swift 1644 at 5 gigahertz. And let's also look at some radio upper limits from other tidal disruption event candidates. And so looking at the upper limits compared to the radio light curve, they fall well below that. And so the obvious explanation for this that sh uh, should jump into your head is that, well, you know, of course this is on axis and maybe these are off axis events. And so they're much dimmer, but this is already quite late in the light curve evolution. And we expect by this time, the jet to should have slowed down to non-relativistic speeds and uh, should have isotropized. And so we don't think making viewing the jet off axis could significantly suppress the emission. So this is pointing to an apparent dearth of uh, powerful uh, jetted uh, powerful jets and other tidal disruption event candidates. Now we also, we've been hearing a lot about this particular tidal disruption event, Assassin 14 Li, and for, for the purpose of my talk, this is interesting because it also shows evidence of an outflow, which is, uh, however, much inferred to be much weaker than the, the Swift event with total energy orders of magnitude below uh, that of the Swift. OK, so le let's think about how we could possibly explain this apparent dearth of jet tidal disruption events. So there are two natural classes of explanations. So one is that for, for some reason, jets are intrinsically rare, uh, or powerful jets are intrinsically rare in tidal disruption events. And this could be because there you need some sort of special conditions to launch the jet, which are rarely met in tidal disruption events. And speculatively, this could be because you need a large magnetic flux to power the Blanford Zanaic mechanism. And generally, disrupted stars can't provide that level of magnetic flux. The second class of explanations is that jets are not intrinsically rare, but generally the density of the circumnuclear medium is too high or too low to, pr to produce observable synchrotron emission from the jet. And uh, you know the, the density of the circumnuclear medium uh, could affect the light curve peak and the light curve time. So in order to explore this possibility, we, we need to figure out what we need to figure out a physically plausible range for the density of the circumnuclear medium. So uh, in a galactic nucleus, we, we have lots of uh, stars. And these stars are going to shed gas through stellar winds. And uh, here's a nice illustration of that, which I sto stole from Nora Lutzen, uh, Lutzendorf's website, just because I thought it was, was cool. So um, yeah, but, and the other thing, uh, want to show with this picture besides, you know, that it's, that it's nice to look at is that um, th this process is likely to, to be quite complicated. You have to think about uh, the fact that you have individual stars and um, they're moving around in, in complicated ways. So just keep, keep that in the back of your head as, as I go to my, my spherical cow model. So uh, we're, we're going to take a simple model for the circumnuclear medium. And uh, th this is uh, similar to, this is essentially the model in quarter 2004 for the galactic center if you're 
familiar, familiar with that, and we also describe it in a recently published paper. Okay, so you have the black hole, you have a stellar population around it, injecting gas through stellar winds. And uh, we're going to take a simple 1D spherical model. So some of the, so gas can either inflow or outflow. At small scales we expect it would inflow, at large scales it would outflow. And uh, at some characteristic radius, the velocity of the gas will pass through zero and that characteristic radius depends on the black hole mass and the heating rate. Okay, let's, uh, let, let's see how the gas density, well, I'll, I'll start with inflow rate and then work towards the gas density. Let, let's see how the inflow rate and the gas density depend on the parameters of the problem. So the inflow rate is related to the stellar mass enclosed within the stagnation radius via a mass return efficiency which depends on the properties of the stellar population like the stellar age, if you have large massive stars, they're going to shed a large amount of gas through stellar to stellar winds. And to, to be concrete, I'm going to choose a particular stellar density profile to, to give you a concrete scaling. So I choose a, a cusp-like density profile for the stars, uh, and Nick gave a nice motivation this morning for why uh, uh, about cusp and core de stellar density profiles and why we expect the, the cusps to be more relevant for tidal disruption events. So the, to remind you, the cusp density, uh, stellar density goes roughly as radius to the, to the minus two. I've, I've chosen slightly sh uh, shallower sub here. So it, it scales um, with black hole mass and mass return efficiency and most sensitively with heating rate. So we already see that the heating rate is going to be quite an important parameter in this problem. Uh, from the mass inflow rate, we can estimate a, a gas density. And so he here's a, a scaling relationship for that, again, for a cusp-like stellar density profile. So we see, again, the scaling uh, with black hole mass, mass return efficiency. Uh, we, fi we generally find uh, 1 over r density profile. And then the most sensitive scaling is with, with the heating rate. Okay. Um, and so this is, now I'm going to show you a few examples of get, uh, steady state gas density profiles we've solved for and uh, how they vary with the parameters of the problem. So this shows a few different profiles for different black hole masses and heating rates. Uh, so the, if you look at the blue solid and orange solid curves, the, the blue solid is a higher heating rate. And it, uh, this uh, profile has a, a smaller stagnation radius that the you have a higher heating rate, so you're blowing out more of the gas, and so the stagnation radius is at small radii. And then as you decrease the heating rate, the stagnation radius, the point where the velocity goes through zero, moves outward, and the gas density increases. Okay, this slide is essentially showing the, the same thing. I've just added the velocity profile, right? So the as I decrease the heating rate, the stagnation radius moves outward and I increase the density, right? Uh, so let's think a little bit about the heating rate in galactic nuclei. So there are several potential sources of heating. So in, uh, in particular, I'd like to, to highlight the role of young massive stars with fast stellar winds. So if you have a significant number of those, those could provide a significant heating source. The, the wind velocities for massive stars are going to be quite high, order 1,000 kilometers per second. Um, there, there, are other, and, uh, there are other sources of heating, uh, also like 1A supernovae, um, and uh, black hole feedback is another potential source of heating, which I'm, I'm not going to consider here because TDs are 
our existing t TDE candidates are in inactive galaxies. And so th just to, to explain a little bit of what's going on here, so for, uh, for each black hole mass, I've taken a star formation history, uh, an appropriate halo average star formation history. And at the low black hole masses, you have sufficient star formation to produce a significant number of young stars and provide a significant heating rate. Uh, yes? Um, let's see, so it, it's going to depend on the, the star formation rate. So it's a convolution of the star formation rate and the, the delayed time distribution. Um, Right, so the, the star formation rates are taken from uh, abundance matching models. And uh, essentially for each black hole mass, we, we, we want a star formation history that would produce a bulge consistent with the MBHM bulge relationship. And we, we, we take the, a halo averaged uh, abundance matching uh, st star formation rate uh, for that. Right, and then we convolve that with, uh, for, for the 1As, we convolve that with the delay time distribution. Yeah. Is there another question? No. Okay. okay, so let's think about the overall range of densities we, we can produce in the circumnuclear medium. So here I'm considering the, the space of heating rate and mass return efficiency. So I, and I've fixed the black hole mass of 10 to the seven solar masses and a cusp-like density profile. So here I have contours of constant density at 10 to the 18 centimeters. Um, if you've forgotten what the mass return efficiency is, you can, you can look here. It just relates the stellar density to the injection rate of gas mass, okay? Uh, so one thing that is important to think about is if you decrease the heating rate of the gas too much, it'll become thermally unstable, condense into uh, cold clumps, and we're, inter we're most interested in the density of the volume filling hot phase of the gas, so we, we ignore regions of the parameter space which would be thermally unstable. So that's below this black line here. And now uh, we're going to consider different extreme, extreme star formation scenarios uh, to see what range of gas densities we can get. Uh, and here, here we're just trying to see what is the, the, the most extreme range we, we can get in our, in our formalism. So at the high density end, we can consider a stellar population just a few mega years after a starburst. Now here you have massive stars shedding a lot of gas through stellar winds and a very high mass return efficiency of order 100. And the, you get a density of order a few thousand particles per, few thousand particles per cc. And then, uh, okay, so that's roughly the, the highest density we can get. Uh, yes. Really? I, I'm at 14. Okay. Oh, okay, I, I thought it was six, but okay. Uh, well, okay. But now let's consider the, the low density end. So uh, here we consider a mix of an old and a young stellar population. So if you have uh, old stars, the, the mass return efficiency is quite low. Uh, so th this is, uh, if you just have the old stars, you would be here. Uh, and then as you add young stars, you increase the heating rate Eventually, you also increase the mass return efficiency, taking you to high densities. But uh, in the middle, you have a sweet spot where uh, you have a high heating rate and a low mass return efficiency. And so you get a low density of order 0.1 particles per cc. Now, both these scenarios are, are somewhat contrived, involving bursts of, of star formation. The point was just to sort of see what the, the most extreme range we, we get. And in, th in this case, I'm, I'm being particularly generous because um, if you consider the fact that the real stars are discrete, um, 
that this this scenario is sort of this scenario is difficult to realize physically and could require fine tuning. Um, perhaps one effect that could lower the density uh, in real systems. So recall we're considering a spherical cow. Potentially you could have stars in some kind of disk arrangement which could uh, lower the density. And this is a scenario considered in uh, Nyaction in 2005. And uh, in that particular case was found to be about an order of magnitude effect. Um, so roughly we, we find a range of uh, gas densities around 0.1 to 1,000 particles per cc. Okay, so great. So now, um, y you know, whoa. Why did I do all this work? Uh, oh yeah, you know, we, we want to see if we, we could hide jets. So now we're going to take a jet model. And th this is a model that was used to fit the radio data for the Swift 1644 event. And we, we fixed the jet properties to, to, to be the same. Uh, uh, and I, I'm, I'm gonna gloss over the details. Th this is the, the jet energy. And then uh, the structure of the jet is, is somewhat complicated. You have uh, two components, a fast core and a slow sheath. Uh, fast meaning gamma of 10 and slow meaning gamma of 2 initially. And the, the reason you need the two components is to explain why the radio emission stays bright for as long as it does. So we're going to fix the, the jet to be the same and then see how the radio emission would vary as we vary the density of the circumnuclear medium. So here, I look at three different density profiles uh, and look at the calculated light curves at 5 gigahertz, right? And uh, I've also plotted the, the upper same upper limits from before uh, for tidal disruption event candidates. And we see for, for a broad range of circumnuclear medium densities, the we, we get quite bright uh, radio emission. And, uh, it, for, for all these choices of density, it, it falls uh, above these upper limits. So these, uh, to be clear, these, these are on axis, but at least for the two high density cases, we've checked that the, the off a looking at an off axis makes at most a factor of a few difference. Um, and then uh, to, to be re really sure that you know, you can't hide the, the density emission. We, we should think more carefully about this, this low density limit. This is sort of um, wha what's um, most important in, in concluding wh whether you can realistically hide the, the, the radio emission. Um, okay, and then uh, another thing to, to point out is that the peaks of radio emission, particularly at low densities, are quite early times, which suggests we need prompt. It, it would be nice to get prompt follow-up for, for tidal disruption event candidates to, to constrain jets. OK, so, we, so now I'll just go to my conclusions and summary. So we've, uh, come, we, we've come up with a range of plausible gas density. Oh, I, I should have said, so th this is at, at a scale of 10 to the 18 centimeters. So that, that's important. So at a scale of 10 to the 18 centimeters of 0.1 to 1,000 particles per cc, we find um, a bright uh, radio emission for a wide variety uh, uh, of density profiles, uh, n not quite to, to 0.1 particles per, per cc, but it's, it's not clear if yet whether that's, e that's even phys a physical scenario. Um, and so given, and then given the existing upper limits, uh, the, this uh, and our light curves, this suggests that swift light jets are not present in most tidal disruption event candidates. And so this, the implication of this is that swift-like jets are intrinsically rare in, in tidal disruption events. Okay. Oh. James.
think it'd be even lower at 10 to the 18. That's so right. If that were true, looking yeah. Looking at your curve, the lowest density one you plotted was 2. And it looks like that you considered up to 10 to the minus 1. So does that suggest that we should expect in very low density environments, very prompt flares, like even softer than the ones we showed? And I would think that would actually put them above the upper limit for some of the, uh, like when you pull up your Right, so if I take the two, and I imagine like the, another curve in that sequence to the left of the, the two take, that it would actually cross below some of those other numbers. Okay. Well, f first I want to comment on the, the low density. So I think there's um, a sort of a degeneracy in modeling the, the radio emission, and that that's not a, a unique fit for, for the radio data, as I think short we'll we'll talk about later um, and then the other thing I w that makes me doubt the the low density is that this the the 14 li event was in a galaxy which showed evidence of previous AGN activity which w I which I would expect would indicate a, a higher density um, but okay back to so if I considered an even lower density you're saying it w I would have prompt emission. Well, you'd have prompt emission, but the curve, like the yeah. tail, they would actually go below some of the black of the Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. So if you, if you continue, I mean, if, if you take the density to zero, the, the emission, yeah. like, yeah. if... You're basically taking those curves and just shifting this way. Right, 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 that's right. That's, I, I yeah. Um, I think, yeah, well, the, yeah. I'm not sure what what the Lorentz factor is. Um, I don't think it's very. It's certainly dominated by the the slow component at at that in, point. In 
then you go into a different regime where you can have internal shocks, much more similar to ABN jet. So that would be a floor that you hit. And these limits would still be inconsistent with those types of jets in a, in a vacuum. Although there, the, the Dr. Who is doing it more significant. But for, for most viewing angles, these limits would be inconsistent with jets in a vacuum as well. And depends on gamma. If your gamma is sufficient, it's hard to do it with the large angles. Yeah, yeah. So then you compute the probability that all of them are, you know, at a at a disfavorable angle, and then you can rule out the hypothesis that all of them are, unless gamma is ten. So you rule it out for given gamma. So for gamma low enough five, you can rule out those. This is for the four angles. The initial order factor is about ten to fifteen. What I calculated, I, I'm calculating the the ambient gas. Yeah. That's right. No, of course, right. The uh, what, what do you mean exactly by the like? On what scale are you consider are you considering the TDE gas or like the molecular ring? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's a good point. So, I guess that's um, fairly significant solid angle. Um, but I mean, it doesn't cover no. complete. Right. I have the mic if that's what no, no,